used to this thing. Okay, so let's just jump right in. I plan for an hour and I have 15 minutes, so I'm going to talk really fast. <laughs> Not really. Um, how many of you are familiar with Heart Math? Just get a sense. Oh, wow. Almost all of you. Okay, uh, well, our mission, basically, overall, kind of global mission, is facilitating a fundamental shift in health, wellness, and performance. Uh, we're very much a research based organization. You all know about that, so I'm going to skip through all that. Uh, heart Math is now used pretty widely uh, globally. Uh, there are heart math centers in China, Saudi Arabia, all over Europe, things like that. So it's uh, kind of getting out there. Uh, we're the main kind of programs now in many, many hospitals. I don't even have a clue of all of them, but like Mayo Clinic and UNC and things like that. Uh, doing a lot of work in the military, special forces, athletics. Uh, so I'll just give you a, some overview of some of that up front. Uh, over the last two years, I've done a lot of work on the military side myself. I've trained about I don't know, probably close to 4,000 uh, sailors and soldiers and uh, soldiers and so on. So the Navy hired us to develop their resilience program for them. They've got a very good conceptual program, which is actually quite good, but it lacked how do you actually do this stuff to stay resilient, anything practical. So they uh, approached us and we've uh, been working with them. And we started, I love the way the Navy thinks, we'll do a little small pilot project, we'll start with a thousand people. You know, it's a small pilot project. Um, anyway, that's extended into about our fourth contract now. But, uh, so we were training the guys, as it turns out, the most stressful job in the military, believe it or not, is what's called detainee operations. This is the guys that are at the prison camps with the bad guys in Afghanistan, and used to be Iraq, and so on. And it was kind of odd that that was the highest risk mission. I didn't quite get it at first. I do now. Basically, these are the men and women who are, every day of their life, dealing with psychological warfare. So they really have to have a way of maintaining their composure, you know, and sustaining it, not just, you know, like a peak moment or something, but for the long haul. Uh, but what they've basically, I'm not going to read slides to you. Uh, one of the metrics we had there was sleep. And it was pretty much every unit that was deploying on that mission, 80% plus of these men and women had to take drugs to get to sleep, sleep meds. After we, we actually achieved a culture change in that mission set. It took us a while, you know, with a few units deploying and leadership and all that. The last two units, uh, I think the last, the second one for the last had absolutely zero people on sleep meds. Is that crazy or what? So that's kind of some of the things we have to uh, Being used a lot in thousands of schools to help students learn, perform better, pass the tests, get better grades. A lot of research on that. Uh, a growing use now in professional Olympic athletes. This is Anna Hemingway, who's a six go. Uh, she's now a trainer, so she's she works exclusively with the UK teams. Uh, a lot of a growing use in professional sports, hockey, baseball, football, so on. Uh, golf is probably the most well-known that heart math is used in. Uh, it's kind of, if you're, if you're a professional golfer and you don't have an M-Wave, you know, you ain't nobody. You know, it's, kind of, it's kind of getting to do that way. So it's really growing in golf. So anyway, that's my commercial. If you know, the rest of this, we'll get into the science. So really about sustaining optimal function. I'm not so much about the peak moment, peak performance. In certain cases, yes, you need to be able to peak at the right time. But let's not peak and crash. You know, how do we really sustain uh, our performance and our, our resilience, our coherence, and so on. So basically, coherence, well, when I say coherence, a lot of you already know this, but what do you think of? What's that term mean to you? In step, in phase. In step, in phase, absolutely. That's a science definition, yeah. Great. Anybody else? Oh, come on. I'm going to pull the nails today. I can see already here. Uh, okay. The first definition in the dictionary is the quality of speech. Is this a, hopefully I'll be able to have a, convey a coherent message today. You know, or if you've had a few too much to drink, you know, you're a little uh, tipsy. No, that's incoherent, right? So it's, it's coherence, there's a lot implied in that word. You're absolutely right. It's uh, the parts of a system hanging together, synchronized in a way that uh, you have a greater um, Greater than some of the parts is actually embedded in the term coherence. So it's, we use it globally. Uh, if you've read any of my papers, there's coherence physiologically, which I'm mostly going to be talking about. 
but we also mean coherence in terms of our composure, coherence socially, how in sync are we with others, how we have, you know, our communication and so on. We use it organizationally, how coherent is our organization, right? Does make much sense? So we have measures on all those different levels. Physiologically, it's a measurable state. And a lot of studies now, after we introduced the term independent of us, have really kind of anchored the coherence as the ground state, if you will, or the underlying physiological state that really optimizes a wide range of performance measures, especially cognitive. How do you do that? So, me and this is the bulletproof executive thing. I was asked to talk about resilience. So, so resilience, okay, I'm going to ask, try this again. What do you think of when you hear the term resilience? I'm sorry? Flexibility. Flexibility? Yeah. Yeah. Good, great. That's one of them. What's, there's another main one that most people say. Ability to what? Handle stress. Handle stress, okay. Yes? The ability to handle the unexpected. You guys are great. Usually what people say is the bounce back. Bounce back from tragedy or stress, that kind of thing. And that is a fundamental aspect of resilience. In the resilience research world, which is really being driven by the military out of, we're being forced into it, frankly, uh, the perspectives on resilience is really changing a lot. And in fact, this is our definition, which I'm proud to say the Navy's adapted as the official definition. The capacity, which is a key word here, to prepare for, that's new in the definition from most, Recover from, that's your bounce back part, and adapt, so you had it exactly right, that adaptability, flexibility, in you know, the face of challenge, and so on. Okay, so if what this means here, prepare for, if you're resilient, you can actually avoid a lot of the stuff you have to later bounce back from, because you made a bad choice and got yourself into something that created some nonsense. Another kind of key concept on resilience that's changed is that it's a state, not a trait. Okay, it varies. We can have more resilience one day and more or less another. It's not something we're endowed with. Gen yes, genetically and all those things, that's, there's a factor there. Um, so some of you may be more physically resilient. This is our four dimensions. That and somebody else. But that, even within that, it still varies day to day, right? But somebody else sitting next to you might be more emotionally resilient or mentally resilient. Physical is easy, right? That's kind of our physical flexibility, endurance, strength, things like that, right? Now, if you want to increase your physical resilience, how do you do it? Your capacity. Training. This is easy. Come on. Training. Training, right? Exercise, right? So let's say you can do 50 push-ups. And then what do you have to do? You have, if you want to increase that, you kind of, kind of you know, push past it, right? You know, squeeze out a few more. Maybe you go to 55. Do that. Hopefully you rest a day to recover, right? Do that for maybe a week or so. What happens then? 55 is your new norm, right? You've increased your capacity. And why do you want to do that? Other than basic health maintenance. Oh, come on. So you can do more? Well, okay. So you've got that to draw on. Right, exactly. So you've got that capacity when you need it, when a challenge comes your way, so you're able to meet that, right? So it works the same way in all these domains. It's a pretty simple concept, actually. Mentally, um, <coughs> attention spans are a huge one. Our ability to maintain our focus, put our attention where we want our attention to be. You know, I don't know if it's a term in the civilian world, what they call it, squirrels. You know, you're, you're talking to somebody and something totally irrelevant goes on over here and there they are. Right? You really can't maintain your attention and your, your focus of awareness. It's huge. It's a big factor in the mental side. Uh, being able to incorporate other people's points of view, these kinds of things. Mental flexibility. Right? Flexibilities and all these. The emotional one is the one that we tend to focus on in our, our trainings, right? in resilience trainings. Because that's where most of us unnecessarily blow out and squander, use our emotional energy and drop our resilience. They all overlap, they all affect each other. You ever had a day when you're really tired? You notice how, you, maybe I'm the only one, you're, you're reading a magazine or whatever, you read a couple paragraphs and you realize, what did I just read? 
<laughs> I'm not the only one. Right? Or you're probably more likely to trigger on something. You know, it seems like every family, every workplace has got one of those guys, you know, that just kind of pissed off or whatever, and they want you to know it, and everybody else to be there with them. But if you know that about them, it's kind of water off the duck back, that's just the way they are. You know what I mean? But if you're tired, right, more likely to trigger, and they do that thing that they always do, get all, you know, significant about it, and, you know, maybe create some drama. You guys never have drama, though, probably, right? These are guys we don't ever get involved in drama. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, or let's say it's a day that, you know, you didn't spend any physical energy very much, but you get just get really pissed off about something. How do you feel about a half hour later, hour later? My, I'm drained, right. So you see how they, they, they interact and they overlap. So the bottom line here is if we're really going to sustain, build and sustain resilience, it really gets grounded in being able to be more intelligent about how we self-regulate. I guess probably a message that you probably heard a lot here, but I don't know. So the reason that the emotional side of this is so important, and this may sound strange to some of you, but it's the emotions that run the show. Okay? If we're looking in the lab, it's easy to, to show this. I can have you wired up to anything. EEGs, especially heart rate, blood pressure, hormone measures, all that. I can put you through all kinds of cognitive tasks. You know, math and this and that. And, and not much happens. Yeah, you can make changes, sure. But I get you an emotional, I activate an emotion. Big time changes happen fast, physiologically speaking. Make sense? So it's really emotions that run the show, in the hierarchy of things. And that's really the next frontier, from my perspective. The emotions are not understood. You know, and people that try and reduce emotions to the amygdala or this or that. BS. It's much more complex than that. All right, but they also determine what, why, we, why we do what we do in life, what we engage in. That's all emotionally driven. Make sense? Okay. So if you don't believe emotions drive physiology, here's kind of a fun example. So in the stress research world, if we want to stress an animal, you know, or a little mouse or whatever, a very common way to do it is called restraint stress. You don't have to hurt them, you just restrain them so they can't move, very stressful. So here's an example of restraint stress and a husband seat belted into the car, <laughs> having an argument with his wife. Real life data, he's a passenger in this case. So he right out of his log, this is his heart rate. Heart rate variability. So here's where the wife said something that got his words got under my skin. So here's his heart rate up over about 130 or so for about a half hour. I happen to know this guy. He couldn't maintain that heart rate through exercise. His life depended on it. <laughs> and he's sitting still in the car. So are you saying this is good cardiovascular exercise? I'm sorry. Are you saying this is good cardiovascular exercise? I'm saying no. This is not good cardiovascular exercise. <laughs> the opposite, actually. Even after they make up here. Right, his heart rate actually stayed elevated like that for over an hour. And that is typical. And in the fact, there are very different feedback mechanisms in the body that bring heart rate down. If you, did, if you got your heart rate up to you know, 150, 160, whatever, through exercise, I don't know if you've ever, probably, a lot of you are probably athletes, right? Heart rate comes down pretty fast. That's because there's different feedback mechanisms physiologically. From an emotional activation like this, it's the same thing doesn't happen. Your heart rate does not drop back down. Yeah. So do you know why this happens? Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll go to that now. I've got 15 minutes and an hour talk. So, but it's it's a different physiological feedback, hormonal nervous system feedback mechanisms. Okay. So the big issue for most people is that we expend more energy than we renew. Okay. It's certainly true in the military, but not just obviously in the military. So it's that, that balance, we're depleting energy. So the way we, the metaphor that actually works really well, the way to think of resilience, is a, how much charge we have in an inner battery. Does that make sense? If you think of it, we wake up in the morning, we have a certain amount of energy, right? Literally, I mean physiologically, that's what cells do, they process energy. But in all those different domains I'm talking about. So it's becoming more aware and intelligent of how we renew and expend that energy is really the key to resilience. Okay, I'm doing what I'm usually doing four hours in a very short time here, but hopefully you get the concept. So, 
Kind of already said this. Basically, it's becoming more intelligent about our energy.